So our speaker tonight is Alana Gershon. She is an anthropologist from Indiana University. She has just published a book called Down and Out Hiring in the New Digital Age, but she's actually not going to talk about that tonight. So I'll let her take it away. Hi, so thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I am happy to talk a bit about my book, but when I talk to Paul about what he would like me to talk about, um, he really suggested this particular topic. Um, now, so as Michael mentioned, I'm an anthropologist, and for a number of years I've been wondering about something that I actually think you guys have a lot of insights into. And so when Paul said, no, we want this talk, I was like, that would be wonderful. I would love their feedback on this. Now, what I've wanted to know is if large-scale changes to capitalism have changed the ways in which new technologies are being introduced to users and how they're being adopted. Now, this question is somehow right between our two domains of expertise, and so I'm hope, I know I have to do some translation work for you, but I think you guys have to do some translation work back for me, and so I'm hoping we can have some dialogue about this. Um, now, I just told you the shortest version of my question, but it's gonna take me a while to explain what I'm really after, so please bear with me. Okay, so I've done two major rounds of field work in the past 10 years. One has been about how people are using new media to break up with each other, and the other is about how people use new media in the hiring process, both to get hired and to hire people. And I want to talk a little bit about what kinds of questions I ended up with having done research on mediated breakups and how that led me to ask certain questions about hiring. So let me start the ways that anthropologists are really infamous for beginning just about anything which is with an everyday quandary. So I want to begin with a basic dilemma that the people I was interviewing in 2007 and 2008 about breaking up in the age of Facebook often were facing. So sometimes when people wanted to signal to their lover, their friends, and their family that they're in a committed relationship, they would change their relationship status on a Facebook menu option and they would become Facebook official. But if you were Facebook official, when you break up, you have to make the breakup of Facebook official too. And so couples who are Facebook official immediately face a dilemma when breaking up, which is who actually ends it on Facebook. Is it the dumped or is it the person who's dumping? When I asked people, a number of people said, oh, it's whoever gets to the computer first. But others talked about ritually doing it together as a couple. And then one woman told me that everyone in her sorority knew the answer to this question. It was the person who was dumped who gets to end it on Facebook. And then she paused and she said, but not everyone on campus knows this. Well, it's her pause that points to one of the major ways in which people experience new media as new. That when technologies are introduced, you have to work out the etiquette that accompanies these technologies. New media doesn't enter smoothly into social practices, and often various institutions and actors have to coordinate to make a particular social practice widespread. So, for example, when the telephone was first introduced, people had a communicative dilemma. How do you answer the phone? Well, in the United States, Edison's company wanted everyone to say hello, and Graham Bell's company wanted everyone to say ahoy. Well, hello win ended up winning the day, but it turns out that ahoy still lingered on. So if you guys watch The Simpsons, Mr. Burns answers the phone ahoy, right? And so there's these moments that still trace. So today I want to look at how practices around new media become standardized. And in particular, I'm interested in whether different forms of capitalism encourage different forms of standardization. Now, I realize that you can look at standardizing practices as a bottom-up phenomenon or a top-down phenomenon. And in most of my fieldwork and most of my ethnographic research, I look at it from the bottom up. But today I'm going to be talking about standardization as a top-down phenomenon. And here's what I want to think with you guys about. I think it's very likely that standardization emerges in historically specific ways. 
so that people can compare how different types of capitalism promote different standardizing practices. That is, you know, I'm under the impression that I am clicking through my PowerPoint, and that really is not true. Um, so let me try. Yeah, but it's going about to. So when I was saying hello, kind of what you answer the phone, this is what you were supposed to see. Different market structures. OK. Um, when you have different types of capitalism promoting different standardizing practices, that is, when you have different ways of organizing markets, are they encouraging different techniques for standardizing practices? Do you end up focusing on different practices? Do you inspire different types of actors to be involved in standardizing? I am talking about telephone operators and content managers here, right? Like I'm speaking academies of different types of actors involved in standardizing, but I'm actually asking who are the people who are monitoring how people are using technology and when do they intervene, right? And also, are there different attempts at standardizing at different moments when people are adopting and using new media, right? Does it come up at different times? OK, well, why does looking at the intersection between new technologies and users and capitalism so quickly turn into questions of standardization? Which in another way of saying it is, why does it so quickly turn into a question of who is making it the breakup Facebook official? Well, sociologist Irving Goffman, who do you guys come across Irving Goffman a lot? So OK, good. OK, well, I, I, I get to like mention Irving Goffman in my academic circles, and everybody's like nodding and saying, yeah, OK, we get him. So let me tell you a little bit about what he says. So he's really useful for thinking about this, right? And one of the reasons that he's useful is that people might feel the need to, um, that one of the reasons that people feel the need to create standardized practices around every introduced communicative technology is that every new technology reconfigures what Goffman calls the participant frameworks of conversational interactions. OK. Whoops. So when Goffman first introduced his discussion of participant framework, what he was focusing on is how is the speaker who's saying something connected to the things that they are saying? And in terms of new media, what he's saying is that every new medium is going to affect who can be the author of a statement? How many people can be the author of the statement? As well as who is likely to be considered the author? Let me give you a concrete example. I interviewed a lot of people who were breaking up on Facebook, but when I started talking to them about how they were making something Facebook official, it would turn out that they weren't always the one pressing the buttons, right? Sometimes they would be sitting there with their friends, and their friends would start telling them, say this! say this in Facebook message, and then they would type whatever the person was saying, and then they would get a response back, and then they would say, wait, the, he or she just said this, what should I say back? Then they would have a conversation about it, and then they would decide what next to type, right? Now, in these moments, who's the author? Well, in some sense, the person who was kind of on the other end of the message thought, that it was only, they were only communicating with one person, but it turned out they were actually communicating with a group of friends, right? And part of what allowed this to happen is that it wasn't a face-to-face -face communication, and the ways in which the Facebook interface worked and when people were there to look at it, that you could have multiple people involved in these conversations. Um, now, in the case of a Facebook profile or a LinkedIn profile, the author of the profile, so to speak, is widely regarded as the offline person with an offline name and appearance that resembles the profile's name. But anyone in one's network might be contributing to what the person looks like. So if you think about LinkedIn profile, like what the image of the person is. If you link, think about LinkedIn profiles, you get endorsements, you get recommendations, you have other people contributing to what that image of that person is on the profile. Um, so, and to give you 
an image of it about um, kind of what happens when America becomes a, char a Facebook character. You have a lot of utterances of other people packaged in the profile of one person. Now, in addition, what is also interesting is that the medium also helps determine who can even participate in the first place and what the value of their participation is. And all of these relationships are culturally specific possibilities which contribute to how a communicative interaction takes place and how people end up having stable identities in these communicative interactions. So because new technologies are offering new possibilities for people participating in conversation and is also limiting other possibilities, the technologies invariably involve new participant frameworks. So each new technology is asking, how do you stabilize these participant frameworks? How do you decide how everybody decides who the author is and who's communicating and who's interacting, right? And in this case, is this acceptable behavior? Like, how do you decide whether this is acceptable behavior or not? These people are obviously both in a participant framework with each other and communicating with people who we don't know, right? And they're part, and those people are part of the interaction as well. Okay. So with this in mind, I want to turn to why I began thinking about standardization, market relationships, and new media in the first place. So as I mentioned, my earlier research has been on how people were using new media when breaking up. I was interested in how people develop strategies to disconnect with each other when so many of today's new media are actually designed to encourage as much connection as possible. And so I was collecting a lot of breakup stories. And one of the things that I began to notice after around 30 or 40 interviews, I don't know if you guys experience this, but after 30 or 40 interviews, I normally know what is people are likely, the terrain of what people are likely to say, right? It's not that I know exactly what they're going to say, but after 30 or 40 interviews about a topic, I have a range of the possibilities. Not so with breakups. When I was interviewing people about new media and breakup, every single time someone said something that inside I was thinking, wait, you do what? And I got pretty good at a poker face the first two or three times I said, would you do what? And after a while, I would nod, I would take a note, I would think, okay, this is yet another completely out of the blue surprising um, expectation. Okay, so what do I mean by what would make me say what? You do what? Okay, at some point I was talking to an IU undergraduate about her Facebook stalking techniques. I really like talking to people about how they develop their Facebook stalking techniques, what are the really good ones, and like do they teach each other about it. And what she said is she explained to me that people put everything on their Facebook profile, that they will always announce any information that she might be curious about. And so she will look on their Facebook profile whenever she wants to know something. But okay, but you guys all know, right? People often have privacy settings on their Facebook profiles that only allow their Facebook friends to see the information on Facebook, participant structure in the technology shaping who can see what information. And so I asked her, how does she get around other people's privacy settings? And she said, oh, I asked them to be my Facebook friend, and they almost always say yes. And then after the she gets the information she wants, she defriends them. And this was a moment that I thought, wait, you do what? Okay, so why was I thinking, wait, you just defriend them, like 20 minutes later or half an hour later? And it was because everybody else was talking, when talking to me about defriending on these campuses, it was such a highly loaded thing to do that to delete yourself from, uh, to delete someone from a Facebook profile an hour or two after adding them is simply not acceptable, right? So I thought that this was widespread social practice. Turns out, not for this person. But I can still reliably get shocked expressions on undergraduates' faces when I tell them that I know someone who does this. Now, I want to point out that even the terms I'm using at the time that I was doing this research were not widely agreed upon. When Urban Dictionary announced that unfriending was a new and definable word, 
One of the co-founders of Facebook, Chris Hughes, announced that the word should not be unfriend, but should be defriend. And that, so it wasn't even settled semantically, what do you call disconnecting in this way? And it's important for my larger argument that while a co-founder of Facebook might have an opinion, Facebook as a company did not take a strong stand on this issue. So in short, nowadays, people's media practices and the terms that people will use to describe these practices often vary widely. But why was I so reliably surprised in my interviews? And more importantly, why did the people I interview insist that there were, was indeed a standard etiquette for how people use Facebook voicemail and texting despite the fact that their actual experiences indicated that this was not true, right? They were constantly finding and interacting with people who did not obey their etiquette rules, but they would tell me very clearly that everybody knew these etiquette rules, right? So I was constantly having conversations like the sorority girl who was saying, everyone in my sorority girl knows how you do this. Oh, but not everyone on campus, right? There was always those kinds of gaps. And I began to realize that we're currently living surrounded by a number of media that have different histories of standardization attached to them. That the telephone has a different history of standardization than email. And so what I'm suggesting is that these different histories of standardization, to a large extent, reflect different ways of organizing markets. That under what I'm going to call Fordism, there are many more pedagogical efforts on the part of companies, schools, and government offices to standardize consumers' practices around newly introduced media. And that under the contemporary capitalism, under what we're facing right now, and you guys can tell me I'm completely wrong and I'd be thrilled, um, but what I'm suggesting is that companies and other institutions are far more concerned with the consequences of taking information to be a commodity and hence are more concerned with intellectual property issues and privacy issues than they are with standardizing practices around newly introduced communication technologies. Although this tends to change a bit when their brand is threatened. Okay. So I'm suggesting that etiquette around new technologies emerges in different ways under Fordism than it does under neoliberalism. So when scholars of capitalism tend to talk about Fordism and Taylorism, they tend to talk about these kinds of factories. They talk about an assembly line efficiency that means that craft was no longer involved in manufacturing. They say that the labor of the mind and the labor of the body are separated, and the focus is on how to make the worker's actions as mechanical and predictable and efficient as possible, to make the worker an extension of the machine. And to do this, industrial engineers and managers have to monitor workers, figuring out the simple repetitive jobs a worker could do, and then ensuring they do it as efficiently as possible. So the end result is the mass manufacturing of homogeneous products, really similar products, by regimenting production in particular ways. It also meant de-skilling industrial labor, right? You get rid of the craft element to it and in the name of scientific efficiency, an increase in a very specific time, type of mind-numbing and often back-breaking work, right? Like think about this work, really relatively boring to have to do for months and months on end. Um, now, there are some people who looked at this and said, but actually what this does is let workers think in more imaginative and productive ways because while their bodies take over, their minds go in multiple ways and do interesting things. And so what it meant is that workers could think too much and that this was a risk. And so what they had to do alongside with having these workers work in these mechanical ways is to have morally restrictive codes of behavior, including having prohibition and having an emphasis on sexual restraint, right? So even in this moment of Fordism, even in the original moment, when Ford is trying to standardize production, how this affects consumers and consumers' understanding of their relationships to objects is also very much an issue. So standardization is not just standardization of production, 
It is also standardization of all the ways in which people interact around these objects. So companies and schools and government offices were all invested in promoting an ethos of very mechanical and socially standardized practices. And they engaged in a lot of teaching exercises whenever a new technology was introduced, from stereographs to telephones. Okay, stereograph, do you guys remember viewfinders? Have you, yeah, okay. So viewfinders are the older version of stereographs, which was originally introduced here. They got introduced into schools, and when they were introduced into schools, they always came with manuals which told the teachers how to make the students sit and hold themselves vis-a-vis -vis the stereograph. Now think about it, viewfinders, you never had to be told exactly how to hold your body, right? But when people were introducing these technologies, they thought that the thing to do was to make it as mechanical and standardized as possible. So they couldn't even introduce view, the, the early version of viewfinders without the kind of Fordist attempt at standardization. When telephones were introduced, companies were deeply concerned about how people's participation might be altered and they were really concerned because these were often party lines, and so all of a sudden you had many more passive and unseen um, observers on conversations. And so Claude Fisher, who's a US historian of the telephone, who's at Berkeley, um, writes about how telephone companies in the 1910s and 1930s were always posting these kinds of newspaper ads and trying to tell people how to have party line etiquette. They told people not to eavesdrop and not to occupy the line with long conversations. And they had telephone operators intervene whenever anybody wanted to have a band rehearsal on a party line because one house happened to have a ukulele and the other had a banjo and another had a really great baritone. And so people were tempted to use party lines to kind of practice band rehearsals instead of trekking through the snow or trekking around to get to be in the same place. Telephone operators were told they had to intervene and not allow party lines to be used this way. They also ended up sending talkative customers warning letters so that when people were seen as talking too much, they would be told, no, you've got to stop doing this. Um, now, notice something. The technology is creating new actors and new connections. First, a party line requires several, several households to share a single telephone line, thus allowing single individuals from a household to join or overhear telephone conversations taking place on the line. Second, companies expected telephone operators to monitor party lines to prevent talkative off people, who are often understood to be women, from dominating this shared medium which means that telephone operators, almost all of them were also women, had an assigned role of monitoring as a company representative. The telephone line allowed not only new, primarily silent participants into conversations, but also a new type of participant, the operator, to engage in these conversations and assist in making sure that everybody followed these standardized practices. Okay, so this, this is the Fordist form of standardization around newly introduced technologies. Large scale teaching projects by companies, governments, and schools to ensure that everyone uses these technologies in the same way. Okay, so I wanna turn now to neoliberalism. Can I ask you guys, do you need a quick definition of neoliberalism? That would, okay. Let me see what I can do off the top of my head. Many people talk about neoliberalism as the kind of capitalism that says that the market is the solution for everything, right? That, and one of the things that the market does is it offers the best form of spontaneous order. And this is why they're turning to neoliberalism as the solution. So what does that mean? It means that anything that is governed by a centralized authority is going to be worse and inefficient, so you have to get rid of the welfare state because that implies government bureaucracy as a centralized form. And, um, and it involves a lot of deregulation, which you might recognize at the moment. Um, one of the things that it also means 
and this is something that I argue in my hiring book and I'm happy to talk about it more, is it also means that you start thinking of yourself in a new way because if the market logic is supposed to dominate everything, in order to be a market actor in the employment space, you start thinking of yourself as though you are a business. And so you start thinking of yourself as though you could have a personal brand, for example. Personal, the idea of personal branding comes along in 1997 at the same time that people are really spreading and thinking about what neoliberalism means. And you think of yourself as a bundle of skills, assets, relationships, experiences, and qualities that has to be consciously managed and continually enhanced. Um, now, under this, and, and Frederick Hayek really, in the 1930s, was one of the major espousers of neoliberalism. Um, but we came across it this way. This is how it entered into our lives, through Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. Now, under, now, these contemporary forms of capitalism, what I've been calling neoliberalism, there isn't the same emphasis on everyone using technologies in the same ways. In fact, just the opposite. Here, I really would love your feedback on this point. Companies are often encouraging users to use technologies in their own distinctive ways so that users feel as though they are deeply invested in the media. And the equivalent of telephone operators still accompany new media but only as invisible actors making decisions according to a logic of standards that if and when they exist are purposely kept secret. Okay, so for example, in early February 2012, the Gawker website release posted a leaked copy of Facebook's operation manual for content managers. This was done by Odesk that has now become Upwork. It combined with Elance while I was doing field work here in 2014. Um, now, here's an interesting puzzle. When I first heard about this, I was like, why does Facebook have this secret so that the manual has to be leaked, right? Now, apparently, Facebook had been outsourcing, censoring posted content to companies like Odesk who were hiring workers in Morocco and the Philippines to look at thousands of photographs for around a dollar a day. And these workers were not told that Facebook was indirectly hiring them, but they weren't idiots. They figured it out really quickly that what they were looking at was the Facebook's version of the sewer of the internet. So a frustrated Moroccan employee gave this manual that had been given by Odesk, produced by Facebook, that was supposed to help him determine whether a particular photograph was acceptable or not. Now, Facebook claims to have community standards on its website, but they're actually much vaguer than anything that was in the manual. At the time, the community standards available on Facebook for anyone with internet access to see explained, and here I'm gonna quote, as a trusted community of friends, family, coworkers, and classmates, Facebook is largely self-regulated. People who use Facebook can and do report content that they find questionable or offensive. We have a strict no nudity or pornography policy. Anything that is inappropriately sexual will be removed. Before posting questionable content, be mindful of the consequences for you and your environment. What did the operation manual say? Well, the operation manual tells content managers that by contrast, what is forbidden is any obvious, in all caps, sexual activity, even if naked parts are hidden from view by hands, clothes, and, or other objects. And then the manual continues to provide 11 more entries about what might count as a violation of standards. If you only read what Facebook publicly announces about its standards, you might not know that maps of Kurdistan were unwelcome. It also turns out that earwax, whether real or cartoon, were not, was not acceptable, but images of real and cartoon snot are absolutely fine. Okay, so in short, as a corporation, Facebook may have to employ content managers to protect its image, its brand, but as a neoliberal company, it's not in the business of openly instructing users about how best to use Facebook. 
Okay, so there's an intriguing exception to this, which, recent, which has been in the news for a while because of how it affects um, drag queens, which is Facebook wants online profiles to represent offline people. But for me, th I'm taking this to be an exception that supports my larger argument that companies have changed the ways in which they encourage standardized media practices by when they're following neoliberal principles. So after all, companies are focusing more and more on treating information as a commodity and thus focusing more and more on intellectual property issues and privacy rights. So when Facebook insists in their statement of rights and responsibilities that users provide their real names and information and do not provide any false information on Facebook or create an account for anyone other than yourself without permission, end quote, the company is doing more than simply encouraging people to think that they are only supposed to have one coherent identity across a range of media. Facebook is also requiring people to provide information that can most effectively be data mined and turned into profit when they sell it to other corporations. What, after all, does an advertising company want with detailed profiles of the kinds of movies a thousand Frodo and Bilbo Baggins like to watch? When Facebook and other social media corporations try to regulate people's media practices nowadays, it's largely in the interest of gleaning information that can most smoothly be sold to others. So, of the 49 posted rights and responsibilities for users in 2012, 36 of those involved intellectual property or commodified information in some form or another. So standardization, when it's happening nowadays, tends to be standardization in response to what I would say is a neoliberal construction of a dilemma, to protect a brand or to ensure that information is accurate enough to have value for marketers. Now this is not to say that all moments of overt Fortis standardization have gone away. Movie theaters are still telling you to, when you're watching movies that you have to turn off the self, your cell phones and so on. Of course, part of what's interesting is like when movie theaters are doing this, this is a moment in which the uses of two different types of media are conflicting, with the movie theater insisting that the traditions surrounding movies that were established in an older period dominate. That is, that the technology with the longer history of efforts at standardizing audience engagement can establish the terms for the audience. Okay. So what I'm saying is that while new media always challenges its makers and users to create some kind of shared understanding of what its use is supposed to signal, how people tackle this challenge is historically specific. So every new media may invite users to question how they're doing this, how, they, how they're going to use the, um, the technology to continue forms of conversations that they're familiar with. That is, people may have decided the proper way to compose a letter and the ways to set, signal whether the letter is more or less formal, whether it's meant for a larger audience or designed for only one reader, and they're encouraged to believe this by their teachers in school. But then when email is introduced, all of a sudden people had to rethink all of these strategies and decide which strategies used in a letter should transfer to an email and which shouldn't. Have you? Do you guys remember when everybody said, dear so-and-so in an email? When was the last time you got a dear? What? You write it all the time? Yeah. yeah, so it turns out I'm always torn as I write this, whether I do dear or hi. And I'm thinking, and every time I'm torn, I think, oh, I'm dealing with older forms of standardization all over again. Is this a letter? Is this an email? What does it mean that this is an email? These kinds of questions are the questions that come out of changes in the ways in which we are standardizing stuff. So because companies, government offices, and schools are no longer as openly involved in instructing people on how to use any new technology, people nowadays are often figuring this out by talking to their friends, their family, and their coworkers. And for most social tasks, this isn't that much of a problem, right? If an acquaintance never listens to your voicemail, you may slowly figure this out and stop leaving voicemails without deciding that this person is just being rude. But there's some tasks that are so highly charged that people pay a lot of attention to what the new etiquette might be when the new media are involved. 
So because we're surrounded by many technologies in which companies, government, offices, and schools have worked for years to establish widespread etiquette around some technologies, it isn't that big of a stretch for people to assume that this etiquette does in fact exist, regardless of how new the media might be or what the actual efforts to standardize that medium's use might be. Yet historical changes in how etiquette around new media becomes widespread sometimes means that there aren't actually well-known or uniform rules for how to use some media. And this creates a very uncomfortable ambiguity for users when these new technologies are, say, part of looking for a job, right? So here's a moment where I think I should stop and start talking to you guys. So I can go on and talk about, like, what are the things about LinkedIn that really puzzle people? Because LinkedIn is both along the lines of Facebook in terms of not having standardized practices attached to it in the same ways in which communities of practice are supposed to spring up organically around it. But it's also linked to applying for jobs in which you think, well, there are very formulaic ways for applying for jobs, and so you need to know how to do it right or not. But I can also, if you guys push me into the questions, start moving into a discussion of what I was talking about in my hiring book, because this is just like one part of that. So can I pause, get a sense from you guys about what you would like? Oh. Um, do you want to have questions? Do you want to poll your audience here? So, you know, I so much prefer having questions and talking to you guys. Like, I Let's clearly am like, just functional out. with the PowerPoint and just like chatting. Shall I get you a chair? Would you like to sit down No, no, here? no, I need to pace. Okay, okay. Harvey. Uh, I was just going to vote for the uh, discussion of the hiring <laughs> that well, I was particularly interested in hearing yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But okay. I mean, I'm just one, one listener. She wants to hear more about things that puzzle you about LinkedIn. Well, I mentioned this at uh, our dinner yeah, yeah. tonight, and I think, I don't know if anybody else has seen this, but if you happen to manage to achieve all-star status and these statuses on LinkedIn. on LinkedIn as to what you level you are, you're a, an expert, you're an all-star, how many of you noticed that if you happen to get laid off, your status drops? <laughs> if, what, if you, whatever it is, all you have to do is not have the job. You're the same person, but your status drops. And then it comes back once you have a job again. He's our all-star, top performer, all-star. Is that enough to get started? And then I'll run around some more and ask what people yeah, ask more okay. questions. Um, so so let, me, let me do some of the hiring stuff for you guys who came out for that, because I realized that was the abstract, and then Paul kind of said, no, 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 we want something else. Let me say a little bit about like the short argument that I have in my book. So as you can tell, I'm really interested. I'm, I live in an academic space where I hear the word neoliberalism all the time and I have no idea what it means when other people are using it, right? They say neoliberalism and I got at some point really curious about can I make this more of a rigorous term? And because either I could ignore the fact that everyone around me was using it or start paying attention and invest and figure out how to actually deal with this term. And one of the things that I've been doing to think about it, because I ended up investing, um, in figuring it out was to try to think how to make it specific for this contemporary historical moment by comparison. And by thinking about, well, okay, what happened under Fordism? What's happening now? So one of the major things that I think has happened, and I was thinking about this especially in terms of the hiring, is that we used to think, um, we, we, had a meta we have metaphors by which we understand our relationship in the hiring, and that we used to think that we owned ourselves as though we were property, and when we brought ourselves to a worker, we were renting ourselves out as property 
for a specific period of time, nine to five often, right? And this notion of ourselves as property that rented ourselves out to the employer really shaped a lot of the labor discussions that was happening and the labor arguments. So there was an argument about whether you should have a 40-hour week, right? How long should you rent yourself out? People would have lawsuits about whether employees should be paid for the time it took them to wear, uh, to put on a uniform, or should the employer only start paying once they were work ready, right? And so the arguments were around this boundary. And what's also really interesting is that people didn't talk much about work-life balance at the time. You hear about it constantly now. But earlier, you didn't have to think about work-life balance because it wasn't an act, right? You had a clear boundary when you got yourself back. So what became interesting is, and here I want you to think back, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, in my mind at least, people changed the metaphor by which they understood the employment contract. And they began to think of themselves as a business, which I've told you about. And when you think of yourself as a business, the, argue, the, lawsuit, the things that people wrangle about legally really change. So now, all of a sudden, there are a lot more non-compete clauses in people's contracts. But the non-compete clauses are happening in really interesting contracts. Camp counselors now have to commit <laughs> to non-compete clauses. <coughs> Yoga instructors, hair cutters, right? Because now people are beginning to think of themselves, their employees, as businesses in their own right that could potentially branch off and then develop their own business and become competitors. So where people are understanding the problems has really changed. But it also means that, in, that people are giving different advice for hiring. Resumes, what resumes look like, have changed now and you're supposed to give the bullet points and the metrics by which you are going to provide market specific problems to the business, right? And the business's problems, you're supposed to kind of explain yourself as a particular match. And you're also supposed to brand yourself um, and develop a personal brand in which you are, have you guys heard this? You're supposed to figure out the three or four words that reflect your authentic self and then make sure that all your online and offline presentations um, embody these three or four words, right? And this is partially derived from an understanding of how you attach personality to a commodity, and then they developed those techniques and then decided, oh, now that we've got these techniques down right, we can now give them, tell people, now that you are supposed to present yourself as a particular kind of commodity, use the same techniques for personalities that we give, how we give Coca-Cola personality, and then turn this into giving a person a personality like a Coca-Cola. Um, I have so much more on this hiring spiel, but it really helps if you guys ask me questions about it. Yeah. Charlotte. Is it true? Is that what? how you get a job? Or is this somebody's theory about how you get a job? Oh, it's someone's theory about how you get a job. But where's uh, the disconnect? Oh, where to begin? Um, okay, so, so the personal branding stuff. I have to say, I, I interviewed 150 people about the hiring stuff, and I talked to people on both sides, the job seekers, and the, um, I talked to recruiters, hiring managers, people in HR. No one on the hiring side talk to me about looking for someone's personal brand. And no one said to me, I had to call them in for an interview because they had such a great personal brand. But I thought, okay, maybe, maybe this is unconscious. And so I started trying to find out, like, do you notice any of the techniques you're supposed to use to create a, pers a great personal brand? No one seemed to notice the techniques. So as far as I could tell, personal branding makes a lot of sense because of this metaphor, but I couldn't find anybody where this was clearly 
what kind of a standard way of sorting people, right? I mean, people, people who were very invested in get, being career counselors would tell me that this worked very well. I remember being warned about social media. Um, yes. You know, be careful about the pictures that you'd post. Yes. Don't yes. get caught with a drink in your hand, or you know, even worse, a, a joint, because God forbid your future employer is going to scrape your Facebook. Yes. Um, did you run into any fears about that, and any actually um, valid fears as well that, that somebody's Facebook was looked at, or that the employers were looking at these things? Oh yeah, people are looking at that. And um, to what degree? Because, for instance, for me, yeah. I, I've never had that issue now. I've never had a potential employer uh, look at any of the Facebook since college when I was one. Right. Um, How do you know? <laughs> well, that's my Facebook. I mean, to be honest. <laughs> so, so this was interesting. People, so, so can I say, can I say there's something really hard about being in this space, uh, being the, the speaker talking about hiring. And but one of the things that's really hard about it is that people like to get really good advice. <laughs> they, they want to know, they want advice about how things are working. But part of the thing that I've been talking about through this entire talk is how actually things are getting much more fragmented. And so a lot of what's happening is that you're having workplaces developing their own communities of practice and ways of dealing with something and interpreting hiring applicants that are not actually uniform, right? So I would talk to people about looking at Facebook profiles and they would say, oh yeah, we definitely do that. And I would say, well, what do you care about? And some people would say, we don't care whether they drink. Like, we don't care about these kinds of practices. And other people would say to me, look, they clearly were doing something that they shouldn't have posted. I don't care that they drink or that they smoke pot, but I don't think they should have posted it, right? And so they had different understandings about what was acceptable in, in, in these lines. And so kind of giving you really standardized advice for large, kind of many, many workplaces doesn't actually make sense. What's happening right now is that the ways in which people are understanding how you're supposed to use particular technologies is specific to the community you're engaging with. And so you, you've all had this experience of having to learn when you enter into a new workplace how certain things work, like how, how do people use reply all in this space or BCC, right? And these small things that I'm talking about are kind of indications that people are coming up with these rules about Facebook, about other things, together and not in a widespread way. Which is why you had to listen to all that stuff about telephone operators, et cetera, so that I could say that. There's yeah. A, um, oh, there's a, uh, there's a book called Persuasion. I think it's by Robert Cavallini. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying he's, are you familiar with that book? Um, he wrote the book per, per, um, Persuasion also. Yeah. And what I was thinking about with his personal brand is he's suggesting different things that you can do that advertisers don't do. Like okay. how you link an image to a, a particular words, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if that, it made me think, okay, you could use personal branding, but you might be doing it in a way that is not overt yeah. or something like that. And if you, you had talked to anybody about, for example, they repeat those, like those three words, those five words. Yeah. Like if you keep repeating that and you associate it with this person's name, you're going to believe it to be true if you do it enough. Yes. So look, I'm telling you, I don't have a way of knowing yeah. whether whether this works. But it takes a lot of time to do this. Like personal branding can consume a lot of your time. And I'm not sure that it's the best use of your time. Given that I'm not sh I don't have good enough evidence that it works, right? And if you, if you wanna use it and if this, this makes you feel better and it seems to work for you, sure. 
right? But I, I really, I tried to find out, right? Like I really was interested in whether this was useful or not for people because so many people were telling, were giving this as advice. And I could see why it logically came out of the metaphor that people are starting to use about being the CEO of Me Incorporated. If you're the CEO of Me Incorporated, it makes sense that you would need a personal brand. But in practice, the other thing, okay, can I say something else that just really worries me about personal branding? Which is that you're supposed to be, it's, it's, you're supposed to link to an authentic self and you're supposed to be really consistent in every context. And can I say that, I used to say this before our current political situation and it now reads really differently, but the people in my life who are most consistent and like don't change according to context are really the most unpleasant people. Like, and I'm kind of wondering like what does it mean to, ha to encourage people to be consistent in this way when what you might want really to hire is someone who can adapt easily to different contexts and turn different parts of who they are, make them visible, right? So, so, so I have a lot of skepticism about personal branding, but most of it I'm like, wow, that takes a lot of time. I have a quick comment about a uh, hypothesis about the related, I think that now a lot of, for a lot of the new jobs, entry level jobs, yeah. um, where they have uh, hiring managers, this is total theory, okay. um, where those hiring managers are t 20 somethings that are using their Facebook. I think some of it has to do with relatability. Is this someone that I would like to yeah. work with? Yeah. yeah and absolutely. so personal, personal branding that, you know, I've seen this on some, face, um, some LinkedIn pages where they'll tell a personal story or something that I it's their brand, it doesn't hit you in the face, but it's like, would I like to work with this person? Yeah. And it's, um, my question on the standardization part is, um, for a while, I, I'm very interested in the future of work or, or jobs of the future. And for a while, you would, what happened, the reality was that people would go and you'd look at companies like Intuit. If you're looking for a product manager, you, you find the rock star product managers, where they work, what's the description, and you, you would take that for your own company and say, we should hire people like this. Right. Um, or you'd steal them from Intuit or something. And, um, um, now, as the jobs are, um, the new jobs are evolving, we're saying that the education isn't training people for those jobs. Um, what does that mean for the bits and pieces that we are, where there's not, uh, those old standardized jobs aren't going to fit much longer. We're going to have a grinding of gears. And what does that mean for how people should hunt for jobs or how people should find um, people for those jobs? So I think, I think what you're talking about is something that, that, I, that, that in some sense I was trying, I find really interesting, like the basic problem you're talking about is that we're changing ideas about how work should function very quickly, but we're not changing all our infrastructures for it. So we're not necessarily changing the ways we create job descriptions, some people are, but not everyone is. And so, and can I just say laws really not catching up with the changes. So there's all these ways in which the infrastructure is reflecting an older metaphor and, 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 we're, and it's clashing because we have this new metaphor that we're trying to use. Um, I think one of, one of the things to wonder about is this is a metaphor that we are telling each other we should be doing all the time. I mean, this is, this is constantly something that you're getting whenever you're going to job seeking advice, workshops or everything that you need to use this metaphor. I don't know how well this metaphor actually works. Like, I don't know if this makes people have better workplaces or be happier in, in work situations. One of, one of the quick things that I can say is one of the things that this metaphor does is encourage you to quit jobs regularly or to choose the jobs that you are taking right now, anticipating the next job you can get after that. And I, I think that, that 
is helpful for some parts of the company, but not all parts of the company, and that we also, we've given up on valuing repositories of knowledge or people acting as repositories of knowledge as much. I mean, so this isn't, I guess what I'm trying to say is if I were to imagine a future of work, it would not be clinging to this metaphor. Like I, I'm, ho I'm hoping by being as explicit about it as possible and in my conclusion to my book, I try to take through you all the things of, well, does this actually give workers much? Does this make workers' lives better? Uh, not as much as one would like to maybe encourage people to come up with another metaphor. Okay, right here. Um, it, it used to be yes. that one of the most critical things to get was recommendation. Yeah. And there was a time in the past where you couldn't get a job without a recommendation if you go back far enough. Yeah. But then when I came into the work world, recommendations were something you sought when you got it. It was really valuable. You got it from your boss. You got it from your supervisor. They signed it. It was a piece of paper. It really spoke. Then LinkedIn came in. Yeah. And LinkedIn had recommendations. And in the beginning, it seemed like it was having that kind of an impact. But then they started talking about, well, if you give a recommendation to somebody, that person should not give one back to you. Yeah. Because yeah. now there's suddenly there's this convention of, yeah. well, you can't reciprocate. Yeah. Even if it really is true that both those people were good and they both would highly like to recommend them, it not seems to nullify it. And this has gotten even worse now with endorsements which just seems to be on par with liking in Facebook. Um, it's, it's, it's struck me that one of the most valuable things that LinkedIn had that goes back to the original uh, job search and looking for talent was the recommendation. And that feels like it has been watered down. Yeah, what's your experience well, from well, that? So, so can, can I respond? I mean, like, I know you, you, you didn't necessarily end with a question, but I'm really interested in something that you said because when I, so I was doing this hiring research in 2013 and 2014, and one of the things I was really interested in is how do you develop standardized practices around technologies, right? How does that begin to emerge when you don't have the older way of doing it, which is having companies tell you how to do it and having schools and, and government offices tell you and like what, what's happening now. So what you're saying is really interesting because I saw this as divergent in my, like I didn't see this as standardized practice among the people I was interviewing. And what, you're, and what is this? Sorry, I'm speaking too quickly because I'm really excited. You're like telling me, oh my God, there's standardized practice that I did not come across in 2013 and 14. So I would interview some people who would say you cannot recommend each other. That's really a problem. And I, would f I, I had some recruiters telling me, look, I look for that and make sure that there isn't this mutual recommendation. And then I had other people telling me I would never ask someone to recommend me who I would not recommend myself. This is a quid pro, they understood this as a quid pro quo. So what you're telling me is that somehow there's been a standardized practice on one to, to one level of this and the other version that I was hearing just as much is no longer present. Is that right? Like, what do you guys think about mutual recommendation? I'm gonna ask the recruiter sitting next to me to respond. I mean, I guess it is true that I will sometimes, I mean, I don't put a lot of, I'm a recruiter, uh, I don't put a lot of stock in the easy to get recommendations. Like I basically ignore the the LinkedIn, uh, what's the, the endorsements. Yeah. And, but even the recommendations, I might look at to see what somebody says about a candidate, but I take them with a huge grain of salt, and occasionally I will look and say, oh, this person also recommended the other way. So, but I don't know that there is any standard, I'm sure some people, I know that some people do recommend each other, and other times I wouldn't be surprised if people avoided recommending it, but I, I think to say that there is a well-established Right. Convention is uh, overstating it. Yeah. I mean, it may be defriend, unfriend at this yeah. moment. Yeah. I, I, didn't have a question. Yeah. I'll ask after you. Okay. 
So uh, this is my question uh, yeah. regarding to my own experience. Uh, so I have worked at places where they look up your like Myers-Briggs kind of personality. Yes, yes, so I've sorry. done strength finder tests. And yeah. you know, sometimes it's worked for me. Like I have empathy as like a topmost skill that's coming up always. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, I kind of showcase that as an important skill set as a UX researcher because that's what I work in. Uh, but if, you know, that's what I've learned in the last couple of years. But it's, it, but it's, in, in, uh, it's interesting to hear you talk because Sheryl Sandberg recently talked about that you're not a product, you know, you're not packaged like a product. You should have a voice, and you know, it was it was nice to hear about what she was talking about. But I was still not clear what's the difference between a voice and your brand. For me, they're the two two of them are the same things. Like having your own voice is your own brand, right? Isn't it so? Really? Okay. I like uh, so you. So for me, a brand is so much about figuring out the th yourself as an kind of the three or four traits that cling to your authentic self. Hmm. And you don't have, you can have a voice that isn't your authentic self. You can hmm. just have a voice, right? I mean, I, I, I am cons in, in so, I'm, try I'm, tr I'm trying to think through this because, and, and, and having a hard time translating, right? But here's the reason I'm having a hard time translating. You're talking about voice. In, in, ac in the academy, we talk about making sure ev people have voice all the time. I don't know if you guys have heard about giving the subaltern a voice, but this get, having a voice is a way of being an empowered citizen, being involved in a democracy, being, being agentive, being able to be empowered, none of it is about necessarily being authentic, right? I mean, and when the moment, can I just say, there are moments in faculty meetings where I am insisting on having a voice, I don't think of myself as being authentic in that moment, right? I mean, that's not, I'm, I have a particular faculty role that I'm playing as best I can and I'm understanding like some aspects of who I am that I'm bringing into this, but it, like I, I'm not sure that it's it, it ha it's wrapped up with those things, mm -hmm. and so like so when you tell me this distinction, I hear it as one is about trying to figure out how to intervene in social situations, mm -hmm. and the other is about how to make yourself consistent, mm -hmm. and so I I don't see it as the same thing, mm -hmm. um, but. But, but I think I can also say when I'm talking about personal branding, I've seen people do really interesting and imaginative things in taking personal branding and transforming the ways in which it's often talked about into something much more creative and imaginative. So if you're doing that with personal branding, great. Yes, that makes sense. Yeah, I think the way you're using the terminology maybe, because for well, like when we were taught about personal branding at school yeah. and like that was this was like a couple of years back it yeah. was about personal branding is about your authenticity and you know who you are and uh, uh, yeah maybe we could you know talk offline more about this yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. hi um, would you speak to algorithmic influences one of the things that I've been interested yeah. in is these uh, algorithms that read the resumes, yes. and that seems to be um, a standardizing influence. And I just wanted yeah. to hear what you had to say yeah, about no, it. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. No, you're completely right about that. Um, so, so, so let me. So let me tell you what I was doing for research, and then how. I was coming across algorithms in my research, right? So what I was doing was I was interviewing people about how they looked for jobs and what their experiences were of getting hired and, and kind of trying to get work history and then talking to people about how they were choosing who they were hiring. And what was interesting for me about this was that the applicant tracking system kept coming up as the bane of everyone's existence, right? And it came up as the bane of everyone's existence because the people who were looking for jobs felt like they were going into black holes and that they were coming up 
I, I, I was talking about this at dinner. You'll forgive me for being r r repetitious. Um, one, of, one of the interesting things about talking to people about this is, so can, I'm going to be an anthropologist for a moment, Americans. Americans like to find technological solutions for social problems. And they often like to find um, technological solutions for technological problems. The algorithms in the applicant tracking systems were the only moments in which I found Americans telling me they wanted social solutions for technological problems. They kept telling me that the applicant tracking system was such a problem that the only way to get around it was networking. And so they would talk about how social relationships and connections were the, were the things that were going to solve this problem. I mean, and then I also talked to people who were trying to find candidates to, to hire in which they thought perfectly good candidates were vanishing because the applicant tracking system was not functioning as well as they would like it to. If, is this? Yeah, um, I yeah. was actually wondering more in terms of just kind of intellectual, I'm not, I mean, I right. get it, like the practical yeah, yeah. aspect yeah. of it, but as an academic, I'm kind of interested just the algorithms seem to be a new standardizing influence in yeah. self-presentation yeah, yeah. that didn't exist before, and yeah. it's in that sense that I was hoping you would speak to their presence in the, the hiring yes. marketplace. Yes, okay. Um, yeah, so people, I, I don't know that I have a good spiel about it. Um, I did find people talking about how they were constructing their LinkedIn profiles and their resumes to anticipate this, and that what, what one person did, I thought it was so fabulous um, to be told this, but you probably all know this, is that she would take the job description and make a word cloud out of it and make sure that her own resume had the same word cloud hmm. coming up and that she would, she would kind of make those kinds of matches. And so I think um, people are self-disciplining now to anticipate these, these things. But again, they're also really heavily talking more about networking as a way to deal with this as a problem. The other, th can, can I say the other th interesting thing for me about algorithms that is not my idea, a lot of people are saying this right now, people are not talking about the ways in which algorithm, the kind of, these systems are very social. Like there are all these social biases getting built into them and, and somehow saying this is an algorithm makes it technologically pure of social interaction in a way that like all of you know from deep experience how odd this move is. Um, but in case you're wondering, academics are also saying, this is really weird. Why do people believe this? So yes. Yeah. So I was making myself laugh trying to think about the LinkedIn official. Like what would happen when somebody made it LinkedIn official? Or like yes. the navigation that would happen around the, uh, the breakup or the... <laughs> But that came up in my interviews, right? People really didn't know when to acknowledge that they were no longer at a company, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and I would talk to people about when do you choose to make it LinkedIn official? But the other LinkedIn official thing that I found also kind of interesting was that people who were about to quit, like their coworkers would notice because they were changing their LinkedIn profile. And so that work was make, was a LinkedIn official. Right, and, and cleverly at some point, LinkedIn put in the shall we send this out to everybody or not button. Yes. And so yes. you can now make changes and it won't get announced all yes. over the yes. hell and gone until yes. you're ready to have it be announced, right? Yes, yeah. Other questions and comments? Yes, sir. Yes. Hi. What do you want to be true in the next five to ten years regarding the future of work? Uh. What do I want to be true? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um. Um. Oh, so much. I want. I want people to stop thinking and using passion as a language to describe committing to the tasks of work and start thinking about how important it is to be in 
a good workplace socially and so that the commitments are for kind of creating the best social space possible and being as good to your coworkers as possible and not having this, I, and, and I would love companies to start valuing repositories of knowledge. Like I would love to start having a, a moment in which people say, look, it's good to be at a company for a considerable length of time because you know something in a way that you can kind of anticipate, you, you, you have a knowledge of the problems that have happened in the past, so you can tell us not to repeat them, and so that there could be a ways for, to encourage people not just to be constantly moving, because I have no problem with some people who want to experience new companies, but I want there to be another track in which you can also have a, a way of valuing repositories of knowledge. If I, my complete fantasy would be to get rid of age discrimination. I don't understand age discrimination. We were talking about this. I also don't understand how if you, you are a self as a business and you are supposed to have only these temporary jobs and kind of only temporary commitments to companies, why should the company care about how old you are? They're not gonna be with you for that long. Right? And why is the company deciding how much money you're ready to take as a salary? I mean, like the com companies are often making decisions to say, oh, you couldn't possibly want something instead of allowing the employee to decide, the potential employee to decide whether or not they want it. So like if you're really going to commit to thinking of this as a market space, commit. Right, like this is this is the way who the the ways in which it is being run as a market is systematically disenfranchising the workers, and I would like to find a way for workers not to be as as caught in these systems. Yeah, I think that's a great place to stop. Thank you all for showing up, and thank you, Alana, for being with thank us you. tonight. Second Tuesday of the month, we'll be here. Like to see you guys again. <laughs>